Hello, everyone. I'm Claire. I'm the communications manager at VSL International. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar about external post-tensioning. Ida Vank and Frédéric Tullier will be presenting today. They have about 50 years of, of combined experience, and they both are experts in the strengthening and repair of complex structures. Ida is the technical manager of the repair and preservation global business at VSL, and Frédéric is the technical director of VSL UK. So the presentation will last about 40 minutes, and then we will have a time dedicated to, to questions and answers. So please, during the presentation, feel free to write all your questions in the question tab that you can see at the bottom right of your screen. We will answer them at the end of the presentation. So I will now hand over to Ida, and I wish you all a great time. Thank you, Claire. And it's my real honor to be able to share some knowledge about uh, preserving existing structures to you. And great to have you all uh, joining today. Uh, with the increase in uh, aging structures and sometimes even failing structures, and with the background of the climate change and the increased intention to finding low carbon solution, there is a need to know the state of existing bridges and even to preserve existing bridges. This then often leads to the need to strengthen the structures. So in this webinar, we will explain what external PT is and how to use it to strengthen structures. All the examples and photos that you'll see today will be mostly about bridges, but actually the strengthening solution can also be applied to buildings and this industrial facilities, silos, tanks, and even wind towers. Um, the main benefits of this type of strengthening is that it doesn't hinder the traffic. It's fast, it's durable, easy to maintain, and quite cost effective. But before I start the webinar, I'd like to just get a bit of a feel of the audience that we have today. So you'll see a, uh, on the right hand side of your screen, you see a, a tab with poll. And if you tap that, you can fill in uh, one question that we like to ask you have you ever used external post tensioning in any of your projects so if you can please vote uh, then we get a bit of a feel of the current uh, audience and whether you have experience so i see uh, the votes currently coming in and it seems like we have a quite nice mix of uh, even the majority 60 percent of people that have used external pt before and about 40% that has never used uh, external PT uh, before. So thank you for voting. Uh, that means we have a nice uh, mix of people that have heard about it and some people that never actually uh, applied it. Um, so let's start with the uh, actual content of the presentation. So the agenda for today is um, I'll first start with explanation what external PT is and how it can be used to strengthen the structure. Then I go from uh, go through the construction steps. How do you install actual external PT? And that is to give you a bit of uh, attention points of what it entails to actually construct. Then I will present different systems, different uh, post-tensioning systems that we have available uh, for external PT strengthening. And finally, we have Frederick Toulier joining us. Uh, so the first part will be quite theoretical, uh, but then we actually have an, a project example from the UK uh, on the A52 Clifton Bridge. And feel free to ask uh, questions in the, in the questions tab. And then afterwards, we have still have time to also uh, deal with your questions. So what is external post-tensioning? I'd like to start with explaining uh, the difference between internal and external uh, PT. Um, so internal PT, if you look at the bottom uh, uh, figure, you see a cross section of a typical bridge, a box girder. Internal PT would be the uh, post tensioning that is inside the concrete. Uh, any uh, PT that is outside the uh, concrete surface would be called external PT. 
And this can be both outside the box, but also inside the box. So if you put your PT tendons inside the box, it would also be external PT. Um, I also need to, I will say a few words about bonded and unbonded uh, tendons. You might hear that during the presentation. So typically internal PT is in a grouted duct and the strands are bonded to the structure. Uh, and, uh, external PT is outside the uh, structure and is not bonded globally to your structure uh, because they're only uh, connected to the structure at, uh, at the anchorage blocks. Um, but there's different types of systems. So also within a tendon, you can have bonded or unbonded. Uh, so if you have individually greased strands, these typically are unbonded. But if you have bare strand grouted, this would be uh, the strands are bonded within the tendon. All right, so how do you use external PT to strengthen? Basically, external PT is adding a compression force to the structure, uh, whether it's internal or external. Uh, having post-tensioning to a structure, you give a compression force to the structure. And this can help to increase your bending capacity. So if you look at the top figure, uh, mid-span, you have a bending and you have tension at the bottom. Uh, if you add uh, a compression force that increases the bending capacity. Uh, this, you can then shape your tendon such that at uh, above supports, you have the tendon at the top uh, and uh, below you have it uh, at the bottom. By this draping, by the shaping of the tendon, you can also reduce the shear forces. So I have two blue arrows at the main deviators in the middle. It's an opposing force that can reduce the shear strengthening. There's some other deviators here also that as soon as you have a, a, a change in direction of your tendon, you have this vertical force. Some other deviators also have the force, but I only gave you two arrows here at the middle to, to show that this can uh, add to uh, help you for shear strengthening. Um, there, this type of strengthening is what we call active strengthening. So you add a compression force and it is right away active. And that is a big difference to other strengthening techniques. So strengthening techniques like uh, section enlargement or uh, carbon fiber strengthening, FRP strengthening, they are what we call passive. And what that means is that you apply them and they're not, they're not working. They only work if you have additional load. Um, so in order for it to be effective, you have to remove either dead load or traffic uh, before you apply it or while you apply it. And then only afterwards, uh, when you apply new load, it gets active. The big advantage of post-tensioning is that this force is introduced and is, is, is active right away. So you don't have to remove traffic, for example, for this type of strengthening to be uh, effective. Uh, and the big benefit of that, obviously, is that this type of strengthening can be uh, applied without any hindrance to the traffic. You don't need to stop the traffic for it to be, um, to be effective. So when we strengthen a bridge, durability is obviously a concern. Uh, often, when we decide that we need to strengthen a bridge, there might have been, that might have been caused by corrosion of the existing rebar or even the uh, existing PT. Uh, so the new system that you apply, you wanna make sure that this is a durable solution and it lasts the, the remaining lifetime of the bridge, which, I mean, typically external PT is also applied in new build. Uh, so this type of systems have a, a lifetime of at least the bridge, which is 120 years. Uh, strengthening doesn't always need that type of long uh, design life, sometimes you just extend the design life of 30 years, uh, but the PT itself is a quite durable uh, solution. So a couple of points uh, of why we believe that uh, additional PT is, is, is quite a uh, efficient way to strengthen structures. Um, maybe I'll start with the third bullet point here. So it's, it's, it's a uh, active strengthening 
and you don't need to remove traffic for it to be effective. I think that one is quite, quite important. Then we believe that this type of solution is really very well suited for design and build approach. Um, when you do a design and build, uh, you can take into account all your construction uh, uh, restraints or your system detailing into the design and you can come to a, an optimum uh, solution. Uh, the smart detailing also taking into account access, the, the limits of weight that you might have, uh, you take that into account in the design uh, and then it's easier and faster to build. Uh, in the A52 you will see that they've had a had the run the design and the construction the start of the construction they had that running parallel so that they would have they gained a lot of time and it becomes a very fast solution um, and with all that it is actually also quite cost effective one slide about durability um, i've talked about durability already so it's once you start thinking about existing structures and the need to extend its design life or to preserve it uh, durability is is one of the main concerns so there's a number of things that you can think of like easy inspection low maintenance which is applicable for pt uh, cables um, it's a low weight and it's quite suitable for a wide range of structures so we would definitely classify this as a durable solution all right so let's move on to some slides with more photos um like i said i would like to take you i'd like to take you step by step through the different uh things that you need to do to actually get it installed and then you get a bit of a feel of what it entails and what are the intention points so if we simplify it um, basically you have scanning and mapping of your ex existing structure you want to know where your existing rebar and existing pt is then you have your surface preparation to get roughness you make the blister uh, and your anchorages and then you install your pt tendons so i'll go through these steps in more detail and i first do the first three steps in a bit more detail and then i uh discuss the steps that is needed for the pt installation before i do that i want to say a few words about blisters so i, I use the word blisters now already a couple times basically there's two types of blisters anchorages so that is the end of your pt tendon where the main force is transferred to the structure so that's what we call anchorages you see that on the left hand top photo uh, and you have deviators. So the deviators are the blisters where the, the direction of the tendon is, uh, is, is changed. And then you have to resist this vertical force that I talked about. There's different materials that you can use. Um, typically we use co concrete, cast in situ. Uh, why cast in, in situ? Because then uh, the weight is limited and you can organize yourself such uh, that you have less traffic hindrance. Um, and these can be connected to your existing structure, either with stress bars or with uh, rebar connections or both. So typically what we see at the anchorages where the biggest force needs to be transferred, we have a mix between rebar and stress bars. And then uh, for your deviators, uh, only using rebar connections is good enough. And you can see that in the two photos uh, on the left-hand side. So the top one is an anchorage. Uh, you see stress bars and the bottom one is a deviator and there's only rebar connections uh, we have also had cases where we've used precast concrete blocks it's a bit more challenging because you have to organize the weight of the full block to be lifted and put in place but it can definitely be done uh, or we have uh, applied steel blisters like you can see on the right hand side um, uh, photo all right, so let's move on to the step-by-step -step installation. Um, so for the blister construction, we start with marking of the existing rebar and tendon. So you want to know uh, you will be drilling rebar. You might be making cores for these stress bars. You want to miss the existing rebar and certainly miss the existing PT tendon. So you do your marking uh, and then you start drilling and coring your rebar. You do your surface preparation in step three. So you roughen it 
so that you have enough friction uh, and that you took into account in your design uh, for the load transfer. You install your rebar, glued rebar in step four, and then you install your formwork uh, and your uh, rebar, you finish your rebar cage. Once you've installed your formwork, you're ready to concrete. So here you see a photo where, uh, so this is pumpable concrete uh, pumped in from the top. Quite often, we also have the case where you have a fully enclosed uh, formwork and you have a, a connection for your pipe to pump in the concrete into the, into the formwork. So this gives a bit of uh, more attention to your formwork because you have to make it leak tight. So this type of concrete is pumpable. It's called micro concrete and it's self-compacting. After you've done your concreting, you remove your formwork and you can stress the, uh, the bars, the PT bars for the connection. Uh, and once you've done that, you're ready to install your PT tendons. So the next steps that I go through is the installation of the tendon. Uh, so this starts with the installation of the ducts. So typically these tendons are inside a HDPE pipe. Uh, which you can see on the left hand photo and you might need some some temporary supports because they come in certain length and then on site you will uh, mirror weld these together once you have installed your ducts you can install your strands and then you have to think of okay where do i put my coils of my strands where do i put my pusher is it on below ground is it on my access platform etc and then you install the strand strand by strand and while you uh, push these strands, you typically have windows in your duct that you can see on the right-hand side photo uh, to see that these strands are properly installed. So you close your windows after you've installed your strands. Uh, and then uh, you're ready for either grouting or stressing. So uh, depending on the system that you choose, you grout first and then you stress or you stress first and then you grout. I will, after this, I will present some of these different systems and explain how that, um, uh, which is which for which system. Um, if you, for, I mean, most of you might know bare strand uh, grouted tendons. Obviously, you first need to do the stressing and after everything is stressed, you can grout. Um, on the photo here of stressing, you see a monostrand. So typically, we quite often use monostrands here because of the small size, so they, they can be carried by one person. Uh, and the benefit is also that this tendon can be quite close to the uh, web. So you have lesser bending moments, eccentricity bending moments inside your blister to deal with. Uh, so that is another reason why design and build approach is quite, quite appropriate, because you already actually need to know the size of your jack uh, when you start detailing and choosing the uh, choosing the tendons. So typically we stress with a monostrand, nice and light, and after and then uh, after everything is stressed, you have your finishing works, which is the right hand side right hand side photo. Um, so here you can see that there was anti vandalism protection installed, uh, but we can also uh, typically have uh, or we can have uh, fire protection. Um, and you also install your, your, your caps. And here also, quite often, we can install long caps for the tendon to remain uh, restressable. All right, so I went through all the production or, or the installation steps, and I haven't talked much about access, and maybe I should have started with this slide, because access is quite important. Uh, you want to reduce hindrance to your uh, traffic. So you want this can be very well done from the uh, bottom, uh, but access is key and makes the construction easy or more challenging. Um, you can see on the right hand, uh, right hand side top photo, it's installed, but how do you install it? So there's different access techniques like hanging platforms, even rope access. Or, or scaffolding, which also depends for each bridge. It's, it might be different because you might be crossing rivers and you can't install scaffolding, etc. But you have to think from the start uh, about your access uh, solution. 
So this is, was a fairly quick introduction of the different steps of the construction. We've made a little video, which I'd love to show you, uh, which runs for a few minutes to summarize, to summarize this process. So I, I will run the video for you now. cool right and if it uh, if you show it like that it's also quite easy but i guess with all these things it's a bit simplified and if you know what you're doing uh, it's it's quite easy all right so let's move on to the different systems that we currently have but before i show you uh, systems that we currently have available for this type of uh, external pt i'd like to uh, show you a few of the questions that you need to ask yourself before choosing uh, one system. Uh, I don't think there is one system uh, that is always the right one to choose. Um, you have to ask yourself uh, several questions and, and um, depending on that, you choose one of the systems that we have available. To start with, like I've said that a, a couple of times already, we're strengthening an existing structure you might have corrosion in your existing structure. So there is, there are already durability concerns and that might lead to a wish for a more enhanced uh, system with enhanced protection. You might have, because of that, you might have needs for extra monitoring or inspection. Uh, you might, based on your design and the strengthening and the uh, status of your existing PT, you might want to, you need to choose a system that is restressable. But most important, you need to look at the total at the total solution. There might need not only be one question that makes you choose a certain solution, uh, but it's it's everything together. It's for example, if you have a bridge that is closed down because you found corroded PT tendons, then speed and opening the traffic is most important. And then you choose a system that is available in your country. Uh, because you don't want any lead time of, of different components. Uh, access, the way you can access it might lead to that you want to have a, uh, a several smaller tendons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's the total uh, different aspects that you want to look at that might make you choose one, one system. All right, with that said, let's look at three systems that we currently would have available and we typically apply for external uh, strengthening. Uh, and I talk about multi-strand systems, so multiple strands in one tendon. So I start with the, I would say more traditional and you might know that, so that's the bare strand grouted solution. Uh, you see that on the right hand top. Uh, this is still, the tendon is still fully replaceable. So we, what we, with, uh, so in the anchorages, we have a double trumpet so that you can always remove and replace your tendon. Um, uh, so that is the bare strand grouted uh, system. Then the bottom two are a bit more enhanced uh, protected. 
so the right hand one is uh, using individual both use individually protected strands the right hand side uses monostrand so they're in a single duct for a single strand oversized duct and it's creased um, and that is used in the project in the a52 in the uk uh, we also have applied this quite frequently in, in Portugal and in France. Um, so he, here you have individually protected strands. They are individually stressed. You can easily restress afterwards. But this, this tendon is grouted. So you don't need it for protection, but the strands are inside the duct and it's still grouted, which gives some kind of mechanical and fire protection. The left hand bottom solution is with what we call tightly extruded strands. So these are this, the, uh, the, the HCP is tightly extruded around the strands. Um, and this comes, this is basically comes from our uh, cable stay systems, which are known to be outside and are very, have a high uh, durability concern. So here, what you see, there's parallel strands and they also through the deviator they run through saddles to keep these uh, strands parallel uh, and again this one you can restress and you can uh, individually stress strand by strand uh, the wait maybe i i say one more word about the left hand bottom one uh, so you so this one has been applied in hong kong and has been applied without a duct and that was the preference of the client because you can still see the strands, which are protected, individually protected. And if there's any problem, you can actually see it. So you don't hide it inside the ducts, you don't hide it inside the grout. Um, then in that case, uh, it was inside a box girder. So the strands are protected from vandalism. All right, and then I already come to my summary. So if I have to summarize, or if you want to remember three words of everything I've said. Um, additional post-tensioning is a fast solution. It's a durable solution and it's cost effective. All right, then it's time to start looking at a project example. But before I hand over to uh, Frederick, I want to give you quickly two project examples. Um, one in Australia that we've recently done. So Everything I talked about was multi-strand systems. We actually also have monostrand external PT systems. Uh, so for strengthening precast girders, so very typical uh, bridges that you have all around the world, um, for these precast girders, you don't need that many strands. So you only need two, three, four strands to strengthen the bridge. Uh, and then we have a monostrand uh, system available that you can also uh, that we also apply actually for buildings and silos. Another example I'd like to show you uh, different from what I uh, explained and that's with steel blisters. So this is a recent project that we've done in Portugal where there was a half joint. So a typical detail that is not very durable or not very inspection friendly. Uh, and it was decided to lock off this half joint and fill it uh, by use of uh, external PT cables uh, and this is where you've seen that this so both the saddles and the uh, anchor blocks are from steel all right with that I'd like to hand over to Frederick who can tell us about an actual project example thank you very much Ido good uh, morning and good afternoon uh, to all of you um, I'm very happy to be able to share the experience of a recent project we've completed and in the United Kingdom in England, which is the A52 Clifton Bridge, which was a complex design and build strengthening project. So the Clifton Bridge uh, carries the A52 uh, road, which is a main trunk road over the River Trent in Nottingham. It is owned and managed by uh, a public body which is national highways uh, area seven and consists actually of two separate bridges one which is called the stage one which is a 1950 structure and stage two uh, which is a 1970 structure and that is the one that has been strengthened 
It's uh, just under 250 meters long. It's a post-tension concrete uh, viaduct uh, with three spans over the river and uh, three spans um, which are the approach viaduct over the floodplain. We can actually see on the next slide uh, the elevation and the cross section of the bridge. So uh, three spans, uh, constant depth, very shallow box girder. Uh, you cannot stand inside, it's too shallow. You have to crawl inside. And then the three main spans with the span five over the river where you have a bit more headroom, but still some very uh, constrained uh, access inside. The cross section, uh, shows you uh, a few aspects of the bridge. Uh, there are three box girders that actually uh, support uh, the uh, the carriageway. Uh, the three box girders are all connected, and inside each box girder, you have a combination of bonded PT, which are the red uh, dots that you see, and uh, unbonded external PT, which are the uh, orange dots. You also have uh, internal drainage for the deck running water, that created some of the uh, issues. The uh, one thing to note is that even though these, um, as you have seen now, we still call them external, even though they are inside the box girder, um, these cables are actually bare strands which were stressed uh, before a formwork and concrete encasement is poured around these strands to protect them against corrosion. On the next slide, you will see now that uh, several defects were discovered, uh, mainly so because these strands are bare and inside a concrete encasement with internal drainage, some leaks in the internal drainage created some corrosion issues in some very uh, specific areas. And these defects were found and they led to, um, to the strengthening works that has been carried. On the next slide, sorry, there's a little bit of, of lag. Um, on, the next slide, uh, on the next slide, I wanted to uh, really show the challenges that led to choosing the solution that has been applied. You can see on the picture on the right-hand corner at the top, um, that's actually me crawling through one of the access holes inside the box. So it's very, con very uh, confined, very difficult access. You can see uh, at the bottom the two concrete encasements with the existing unbonded cable. So the main focus uh, of the project was really the main challenge that we had was that uh, the bridge had to be remain open with as many lanes as possible um, because it is essential to the movement of the people in Nottingham and in the global area. There is a, a very used uh, road under Span 1 called Clifton Lane that we had to keep open as much as possible because it's heavily used during commuting times. But there are also walkways, cycleways, and even a bridleway for horses under uh, some of the spans. So it means that whatever solution uh, had to be implemented, we were going to implement, really had to consider this interaction uh, with the members of the public. But at the same time, because the bridge uh, use is critical, um, we had to uh, keep as many of the lanes open as long as possible and uh, manage high expectation from the public and all the stakeholders uh, um, who are concerned with this bridge. It's a project that uh, had high profile in the region and nationally um, media attention. So the uh, little pictogram that you see is part of the media campaign that we ran during the entire project to keep the public informed of the different stages and what was happening on the project throughout throughout the project. And the third challenge there, uh, I've discussed it already, a very confined space inside the boxes. So really we had to juggle all these different um, and challenges and a few more you will see on the next slide because uh, we had to go fast, so to go fast, um, we, we could have gone inside the bridge to try to minimize aspect uh, of impact to the people under the bridge, but doing that would have been a lot more, lot longer process and a lot more difficult. So we decided to add the strengthening on the outside 
to avoid working in these confined spaces, but that itself had challenges, meaning that we were working at heights. So uh, over some of the, where we were over ground, we could just use uh, uh, elevated platforms or um, scaffolding, but over the river, you can see on the picture, we had to fully suspend all the access um, over the river and over some of the uh, footpaths which are used uh, daily by, by the public. In addition, because it's a river, there's actually uh, a, a managed floodplain right on the south side of the bridge, which means that every winter um, spends uh, two, three, four, five, uh, usually flood every winter. It's part of a, a flood management with uh, barriers all around it, which means that we also had to, to deal with this. Last but not least, we had to uh, uh, secure permits from various entities uh, to do all the work we had to do from the local council, the region, um, the environmental agency, the river and canal trust who manage the rivers, etc. But actually, that actually went very smoothly because everyone understood uh, the criticality of the project. And although everything uh, we had to apply for all these permits, um, none of them were unduly uh, withheld but we still had to uh, manage uh, quite a few uh, conditions, but um, that went fine. Uh, the scope that we uh, carried out of the pro on the project was uh, first to come up with a concept design for the strengthening solution uh, with, uh, you'll see on the next slide, the various type of strengthening we applied. Uh, then we took that to final design and then we carried out all the works in uh, all six spans of the bridge. And as a part of the deck was closed during uh, the strengthening, our uh, the bridge owner took the opportunity to uh, carry out minor repairs on the deck top surface and redo all the waterproofing, the surfacing, the asphalt and the expansion joints. So on the next slide, you see uh, a bit more in detail the strengthening that was applied and the strengthening here um, is mainly two types of uh, of post tensioning you have uh, shown in uh, purple color um, unbonded post tensioning so these cables that run on the outside of the boxes but for reasons that i don't have time to uh, go through here unfortunately we also added bonded post tensioning and this is what is shown in green so in span two of the approach spans and then in span five four and six either at the bottom of the box or the top of the box we added bonded pt tendons but you will see on the next pictures that actually even though these are bonded uh, they are placed inside ribs which are continuously connected to the box order they are also placed on the outside because of these issues of access. And last but not least, in the design and all the detailing, we incorporated the possibility to add further strengthening in the future, uh, should it be required. Because the one thing I didn't say is that uh, you have a combination of external and internal post-tensioning existing in the structure. The internal post-tensioning has been inspected and is in very good condition. But nonetheless, the strengthening that has been added is mainly to cater for deficiencies in the existing external tendons, which are now uh, redundant. But uh, should in years to come problems arise in the existing bonded PT, then all the detailing has allowed uh, made provision for additional strengthening to be added. So if we go to the next slide then, you'll see a picture uh, the timeline for the project so february 2020 uh, issues uh, during regular maintenance and detailed inspections were uh, found in april so a couple of months later the strengthening started and uh, within a few months in november we had already uh, carried out enough work on the more critical approach spans to uh, open two lanes fully to heavy truck uh, traffic and then followed uh, a couple of more milestones to fully reopen in October 2021, all five lanes running on the bridge with a completely refurbished uh, deck. On the next slide, you'll see now some uh, pictures of the finished work. So spans one, two, three, the, the shallow boxes, the approach viaduct, uh, we added 
uh, one external tendon on each web, so six in total, containing 27 strands, and they run uh, for all three spans. They cannot run any further because there's an ex expansion joint uh, between span three and span four. And spans four, five, six, uh, you see on the pictures, we've added this time two tendons per web, uh, so two tendons of 27 strands. And also you see uh, the ribs running at mid-span um, for bonded tendons, which are 12, uh, 12 strand bonded tendons, and also ribs at the top uh, in the area of the piers with, again, two tendons of 12 strands. And the two, uh, two pictures at the bottom show a deviator block and an anchorage for a bonded tendon. And the one uh, completely at the bottom right-hand corner shows a very large anchor block to anchor um, 27 times four strands. So a very large force to anchor to the structure. And with that, just uh, my last slide, and then we'll have the question, is really the lessons learned from this project. I think the first one is the importance of collaboration from all the parties to successfully uh, deliver this project uh, fast and safe. And it would not have been possible without the complete trust of the Bridge Owner National Highways. And then the excellent work that was done at the start when the problems were first discovered by uh, Balvac, Atkins, and Kier, who uh, uncovered some of these issues, and then by our team of VSL staff and our designer, Tony G Partners and Coe, to carry out all the strengthening design and build uh, project. The second lesson learned, of course, is that the design and build approach allowed us to phase the design and the works and deliver uh, the strengthening uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, as uh, the design had progressed sufficiently, we were already starting some of the works before the design was done because we had staged the design with critical milestones to be reached before we could then start a particular phase of the works. And last but not least is the importance of carrying out thorough inspection and maintenance. So very often some defects can be hidden and not easy to find, but it's really worth and um, it was excellent from our client to really make the effort to carry out uh, thorough inspection and maintenance to uh, find issues before they became more critical. And that's really a lesson for every uh, existing infrastructure. And that concludes um, my very short uh, discussion on this A52 project recently completed. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, very interesting to actually see how not maybe not so easy or what challenges there are for an actual project. So thank you very much. Very cool to see. Um, and then we move on to the Q&A. So we have invited Andrea Swatch, who is the uh, manager of the uh, what we call business line repair and preservation of VSL, to watch your questions to help us uh, gather and, and, and maybe combine some of the questions uh, to go through the uh, question uh, questions. But at the same time, you'll see you also will see a pop up uh, appearing. Um, we've made a summary uh, of this, what we've discussed today, which we call a leaflet, and you will have a pop-up where you can download this leaflet. Um, but I hand over to Andreas to go through the questions that you might have. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Ido and Frederick, for um, sharing your experiences and uh, the very good presentation and certainly triggered a number of questions from the audience and I've tried to group them a little bit so we can try to touch at least on the majority of them. Um, so maybe first we start with uh, some questions on the more uh, general uh, application cases. So maybe the first one, Ido, I would put to you. There was a question from Mr. Anish uh, Sivasankaran um, asking on how to deal with corrosion damage on existing tenants. Is there a need to repair when you apply that? Yeah, that's a very good question because, like I said, that is often the trigger uh, to start doing your your strengthening. Um, but what I uh, and but you can only know that if you inspect your structure. So maybe even more important is the need of inspecting your existing structures and to see that 
there might be some problems with your um, uh, PT tendons. So um, by inspecting, so you always need to separate uh, inspection techniques for, for internal PT and external PT. Um, external PT, so, so internal PT is more difficult to go inside and see whether you have actual corrosion of your strands. It all starts with looking for voids, voids in your grout tendons, which give a higher risk of actual corrosion of your strands. Um, once you've seen uh, there's different techniques to go in and see whether there's voids, then you can go in and look at your strands. If you see that the strands itself are okay, but you have voids, you can do a filling of these voids uh, with a vacuum grout uh, technique. Um, if you find that you have corrosion of your strands and maybe even broken strands, then obviously you have started to lose uh, PT force. And then based on the design, you might have to decide to uh, add additional PT or replace the existing tendon and put in a new tendon. All right, very good. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, the additional external post tensioning, I think we can say is one tool. We have in our toolbox and there's obviously then typically on these projects uh, the condition of the existing tendons uh, that might have to be dealt with in addition uh, to by either. Yeah. And, and maybe maybe one more. So we we do have we intend to have more of these type of webinars where we share our knowledge. And for example, replacing existing tendons is a subject on its own where we easily can fill uh, one of these type of webinars. So keep an eye out for future subjects. Absolutely yes. Um, so then maybe the next question uh, to you, Frederick. Uh, this is from uh, Mr. Mohamed Asi. Um, there was a question, how can the system uh, be used to deal with an increase in life load on an existing structure? Maybe also linked to that, I would like to extend that question a bit to how can these solutions cater for future additional strengthening needs, for example, if the condition of the bridge deteriorates further? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing which maybe follows from uh, from the question that uh, that uh, Ido had is that uh, when we add this post tensioning um, in the case uh, in the case of uh, Clifton Bridge was uh, we could not replace the existing cables they were just not built there was no detailing and the type of cable was such that we could not replace the cable so additional cables have been added to render these uh, cables uh, no longer uh, required. On a, but we could also uh, apply the same. Uh, you could have a bridge where all your tendons are in perfect condition and um, you wouldn't need to do anything uh, to carry on carrying the, the loads that you have to carry, but you could add additional uh, external PT if you have increased loads in uh, on your bridge. So. Uh, if a bridge has been designed for a certain level of live loads and now you need to increase uh, the, the live load capacity of that bridge, you can add uh, new cables uh, to that bridge in the same way that we, we do when we uh, strengthen an existing structure. Uh, the only thing you would have to be careful is that you may be stuck with putting too much compression in some areas of your bridge. Um, but that's something that you have to look at uh, carefully in the design. But in all the works we've done and all the steps that Ido have shown, this could have exactly be the same could have been done to uh, increase the load car carrying capacity of a bridge. And I think, Frederick, if I'm not mistaken, you were also involved with other projects where actually the system was designed that it got initially stressed to low force to allow for future increase in force if needed. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, very often uh, with some of the new external po post tensioning that gets placed on an existing structure, uh, more and more we, we recommend to the owners to put a system that uh, can be uh, restressed in the future, can be de-stressed if you have to de-stress or where you can replace easily even strand by strand uh, this system. So yes, you could imagine that right from the start, the bridge could be designed with external PT with details which allow them to, uh, to have their force increased in the future. Um, 
that's absolutely possible. In the case of A52, when the cables were first put, we only stressed them partially um, until some of the existing cables were deactivated to avoid additional uh, too much compression. And then the force in the new cables was increased. So you can, you can really stage the introduction of force from external PT if you've got the right detailing and the right system. All right, very interesting. Um, so I think that's a great transition to some other questions we have, and uh, I would like to put them to you, Ido. Um, and this is um, about different systems you have presented. So maybe if you could, uh, there's a question from um, Elliot Vitoli. Uh, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of the three systems you have presented? And maybe if you could also elaborate a bit on these uh, possibilities uh, to restress, which was a question from uh, Jerry Urban um on uh, what strand over length is required uh, in case restressing is required all right interesting questions yes i can uh, say a few words obviously um like i i mentioned the choice of different systems depend on on, on a full global picture uh, but i can say summarize it in a few 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 words um so um uh, I heard something about restressing. Um, trying to remember what you all, all asked, but as restressing. So these bottom two solutions, they are individually protected uh, strands. They're not bonded to the grout inside the duct. So you can choose to restress these at any time, and you can stress uh, strand by strand. Obviously, the bare strand grouted solution, the top one. Uh, after you have grouted, they're bonded inside the duct. So you cannot stress these uh, tendons, any, uh, these uh, strands anymore. Uh, typically, that, that one is done with a multi-strand also, uh, but we still call that solution fully replaceable because the duct is not uh, connected. There's a double duct a trumpet inside the anchorage, so you can remove the full tendon and replace the full tendon with a new tendon. Um, then if you, we also talked about what kind of overlength do you need. So these bottom two ones are quite well adapted for restressing. Uh, you basically need enough strand to put your jack. So we, if we talk about a monostrand jack, you talk about 400, 500 millimeter length uh, that you want to restress. But you should not forget that also, you need behind that some space because you will extend the strand and the strand will come out. So you will also need uh, space to put your uh, jack around this strand and then uh, pull the extension. Um, then in regards of uh, uh, cost, uh, this is very dependent of, of, your, of, your, um, of your actual project. Uh, what we typically see when we do repair and strengthening, the actual cost of the PT components is limited compared to construction, uh, getting labor, uh, access, etc. But in very rough numbers, uh, the, the bare strand grouted tendon is a bit cheaper uh, and the bottom two ones are more expensive. All right, I see we still have uh, quite a number of questions coming in as we discuss. So maybe just uh, for uh, the participants, we will come back to you on all of these questions that you have asked. So if you are not having the time in the next uh, four minutes to answer them, uh, don't worry, we will get in touch and try to respond uh, as well as we can. So maybe um, uh, I would like to touch on um, maybe one other uh, question or several questions that came in. That's about uh, uh, other cases of application of uh, this system of additional external post tensioning. Um, so there was one uh, question from uh, um, the audience. Uh, I think it was uh, from uh, Harry Mucena. Uh, how could the PT system be used to strengthen half joint structures? And I think uh, either you showed previously a photo uh, that showed an application uh, where such a system would actually use uh, to lock up a half joint. So uh, maybe Frederick or Ido, uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on this one? And also, 
uh, another question from um, Jan Basel on any experience with strengthening steel or composite bridges. All right. Uh, yeah, I, ca I can say a few words. Um, so this uh, project example in in um, in Portugal, um, you use the PT system. So this is a you have to look at the total structure. So basically, when you stress what what you're doing is making the uh, bridge continuous over the half joint. So there used to be bearings. There used to be some movement possible. Uh, but you're filling up the gaps and you stress it together so that you make a continuous bridge that will impact your other uh, supports, your other bearings on other piers. So you have to look at your full structure. But basically what you're doing is you fill the gap of your half joint and you stress them together so that you get a continuous structure. Uh, and so the PT here is used to, to get that extra compression in a joint that that is then filled. Um, so you're adding compression to give uh, uh, compression in the in a joint that was uh, uh, open before. Then the question on steel bridges or composite bridges. Um, so not as common as concrete structures because uh, well, concrete cannot take any tension. So you need the PT to, to resist the tension. But we have examples where we have also strengthened uh, steel bridges because you can imagine that steel bridges, once they, they get a bit more deflection, uh, you can use these PT tendons to give this upward force that I talked about by deviating your, your tendons. So you can lift up your, your uh, steel bridges, uh, resist extra uh, shear forces, by draping your tendon such that you, you lift up the steel bridges. Uh, obviously, if you have problems with tension or you need more compression in your steel bridges, you, you can use PT tendons also because all you do is you add compression and by giving it a certain shape, you can also create an uplift force. Uh, so that can be beneficial for steel and composite bridges also. All right, thank you very much, Ido. I think uh, we'll have to wrap up the Q&A session as we are approaching the hour, but maybe just the very last question to Frederick. Uh, um, there are quite a few questions on, on cost of the system. Maybe could you just give an indication based on the example that you have presented from the A52 bridge in Nottingham on how such a strengthening solution compares to the cost of a new build or the cost of a replacement build? Yes, absolutely. So the cost of uh, the, the final cost of uh, strengthening uh, all three boxes, all six pans of uh, the A52 bridge was just under 20 million pounds, which in US dollars is what about 25 million. Um, and you compare that with the cost of rebuilding um, such a, a, a massive bridge. So I think economically, the strengthening absolutely makes sense. But as Ido uh, rightly pointed out at the very start, uh, more and more owners rightly so are concerned with uh, the carbon impact of their infrastructure and we can do whatever we want. It will always generate less carbon to strengthen an existing bridge than to build a brand new one. Uh, and then you will have the issues of how you connect and the disruption, etc. So definitely uh, the strengthening of the bridge um, it, it makes sense from an economical, environmental, and um, user's point of view. All right. Thanks very much, Frederick. I think we'll have to leave the Q&A session here, given time. And uh, thanks, both of you, for having responded to all these very interesting questions we got today. You're welcome. And thank you, everybody, for your questions. And uh, happy to deal with the questions also afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone.